All right, it is 10:30, so we're you know, we run a tight ship here, so we're going to keep uh, keep on schedule here. It's time for the first of our uh, panel presentations uh, of the day. Uh, panel number one, panel number two will be after uh, after lunch. I'm Charlie Corzmo. For those who uh, who don't know me, I'm uh, going to be the I mean, it's I, I'm on the program as the moderator of this discussion. I don't know that it's really going to require that much uh, moderating, but uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I teach uh, corporate law and uh, M and A, and occasionally uh, dabble in securities uh, uh, stuff here at Case Western. Uh, this session is going to be a little bit uh, heterogeneous in terms of uh, a topic. You know, in, in one way or another, all of our panelists are talking about the interaction of. Uh, contract law and private ordering uh, and uh, uh, corporate uh, corporate law, which uh, is a, is a fascinating and capacious topic. So there's uh, there's room for a lot uh, a lot here. Uh, let me just introduce uh, uh, our, our panel very quickly. First, we have uh, participating uh, remotely. So you were I, I apologize to our remote participants. They were not uh, not able to enjoy the dinner last night and the uh, delicious coffee and uh, conversation out in the hall. But thank you very much for. Uh, uh, for joining us uh, uh, remotely, uh, and we're going to have a, a, a paper by professors uh, uh, Choi uh, Galati and uh, and Robert Scott. Uh, I'll, I'll just give a, a brief introduction. Professor uh, uh, Choi is the Bernard Petrie Professor of Law and the business director of the Pollock Center at NYU, uh, the NYU School of Law. Prior to that, he was the uh, uh, Roger Trainer Professor of Law at UC Berkeley, and before that was at uh, the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, he uh, is, in addition to being a, 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 a graduating at the top of his class uh, at uh, Harvard Law School, he's also a, a PhD economist, uh, uh, also from, uh, uh, from Harvard. Uh, professor Gulati uh, is uh, the Parebone Professor of Law and John V. Ray Research Professor of Law at the University of Virginia Law School. Uh, and prior to that, he did uh, tours of duty at Duke. Uh, and uh, UCLA and uh, the Georgetown University uh, Law Center as well. Uh, though I have my doubts about this, he claims uh, in his faculty uh, uh, a CV to have won no awards, prizes, or distinctions whatsoever uh, over the course of his uh, uh, serving in all of these posts. I find that uh, not credible. Uh, less difficult to believe, though, is that he, he does list that he won second place at a fancy dress competition as a third grader in uh, in India, so that is not surprising. The the rest of it, I don't believe, though. Uh, professor Scott is the Alfred McCormick Professor Emeritus of Law at Columbia Law School, uh, director of the school's uh, uh, Center for Contract and Economic Organization. Uh, in fact, he was a former interim dean at Columbia Law School, and prior to joining uh, uh, Columbia, he was uh, dean of the University of Virginia School of Law uh, as well. Uh, the paper they're going to be presenting is, uh, you can see the slides here, right? Provocatively titled, Are M&A Lawyers Really That Much Better? Uh, at what? We'll find out. Uh, and following that is going to be uh, two presentations on aspects of corporate social responsibility and uh, uh, contract design and contract enforceability. Uh, first, uh, uh, Jonathan Lipson will be talking about the ends of corporate social responsibility. Uh, professor Lipson is the Harold E. Cohn Professor of Law at Temple University's Beasley School of Law, uh, has also taught at the University of Wisconsin, the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Baltimore, all over the place. Uh, uh, so we're, uh, we're very happy to have him with us here today. And then last but not least will be our own uh, Professor Juliet Kostritsky, who is the Everett D. and Eugenia S. McCurdy Professor of Contract Law. Uh, here at uh, our very own uh, Case Western, uh, also the director of our Center for Business Law. Uh, and uh, she will be presenting her new paper on ESG and private ordering, uh, a new perspective. Uh, and ESG, for the uninitiated, probably most people here know this, right? That stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. Uh, 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 so also a discussion of corporate social responsibility. Uh, so thank you to all of our panelists for being here. Uh, I think uh, the best uh, uh, format here is we're, I'm just going to have all of you present 
And so save questions uh, for the end. So each of you will have 20 minutes or so to, uh, uh, to present, uh, and that ought to leave us uh, a half hour or so for, uh, uh, for questions and discussion at the end. Uh, and I hope the panelists themselves will, will interact with each other in that, uh, in that discussion. Right? Uh, uh, so let's uh, uh, start with uh, Professors uh, Choi, Gulati, and Scott. I, I guess I'll come up here and sort of uh, uh, give you a thumbs up at 15 minutes, you know, when you've gone through 15 minutes and then just start frantically waving at, uh, at 20 minutes for you to, uh, to wrap it up. But uh, I, the, the floor is yours. including us uh, to everyone there for indulging us in doing this remotely. I, I, I do wish we could have been there, not, not just for the dinner and the fabulous coffee. Uh, my two co-authors are much better at everything than I am, so I will try to be brief in setting up our project. So, uh, so let, let us uh, go to the first slide. You, you have seen our, our title that this project comes from our prior work on contract innovation. Well, I'm beginning to think maybe we shouldn't even use the word innovation because what we talk about as innovation in contract is really a court decision that happens that tells lawyers what to do and whether lawyers do that or not. That does, one of my students said, that doesn't sound very innovative. Is that all that lawyers do? Um, good question, I thought. But our prior work, uh, some of our prior work, Bob and Steve have done a lot of other work, was together on sovereign debt contracts that are rather obscure, I realize, for many of you. But what we were interested in and what we spent almost a decade studying in a series of papers and a book was how after major court decisions, it took a really long time for the industry to change their contracts. And this is very much at odds with the standard theory that we often teach about efficient private ordering. So we were like, well, efficient private ordering stories, especially in finance, tell you we'll have instantaneous change. We find it takes over a decade. That's not so instantaneous. And we also found when we looked at the data that you didn't really find a high degree of innovation or change that came from the fancier law firms versus the less fancy law firms. Now, uh, if we could go to the next slide, uh, one of the questions that we often got at workshops uh, was pointing us to the work of John Coates and others. Right? Now, to be fair to John, and I, I, is that he takes he himself takes a much more nuanced view. But people would often point to, to John Coates's work and say, you know, you're studying this incredibly obscure area, as if to tell us that we were incredibly obscure. We didn't need to be told that. You're studying this incredibly obscure area and this, these kinds of inefficiencies would not happen in the world of M&A or especially in the world of private equity. And then they usually say that something like, and when I practiced at Wachtell Lipton or some other fancy firm, this would never have happened. You can see I'm jealous about that. Uh, but the point was that, look, you're, th it varies. Innovation and correction of contract varies across areas. And they would cite a bunch of John's uh, papers that showed that. But let's, let's go on uh, to the next slide. Well, what got us thinking about that, for, for a while we would just be like, fine, your M&A is so special, you are so special, and you know, private equity people so rightly should make all the money in the world, and we should just stand, sit in the back corner. But we started reading M&A practitioners. And this is the photo of one of the most eminent of M&A practitioners, Glenn West. He wrote an article, uh, and we were very honored, where he cited to some of our work, saying this kind of phenomenon of inefficient adjustment is prevalent all over the M&A world. And then there was a paper by Rob Anderson and Jeff Lanz uh, who also seemed to find evidence
awareness of this. And so this got us a very excited. That was our test. That's the subject of this paper. So if we could get to the next slide, I'll just set it up and then turn it over to Steve. So we found, thanks to Glenn West and talking to m &A folks, in the world of practice that in uh, the period 2009 to 2013, there, was a, there were a series of articles by eminent practitioners in the most uh, prestigious of practitioner journals, as we understand it, is what they told us. And a lot of this was focused on the particular question, I mean, related to what Jill talked about at the, at the beginning in, in, in her a wonderful presentation about being able to contract around fraud liability. And there are some constraints under Delaware law on this. And lawyers were advising other lawyers, senior lawyers were advising other less senior lawyers, I imagine, that look, if you really want to effectively contract around a fraud liability to the maximum extent possible, you need to say in your governing law clauses that the governing law covers uh, non-contractual matters as well as contractual matters because otherwise uh, you might get stuck because fraud might be seen as non-contractual, you might get stuck with the contract law of Delaware, which is very contractarian, but then uh, the tort law of Massachusetts, but it doesn't allow you to do as much private work. And so this was the big concern. And so they said, revise your contracts, revise your contracts, revise your contracts across a range of uh, practice areas, but particularly in m &A. So I, I think this sets it up. Uh, we basically do a horse race that, that on the next slide uh, between a set of areas, and uh, then we analyze it, but in addition, to analyzing whether or not there's innovation in the governing law clauses on this particular factor that I talked about. We also decided to look at useless words. So a bunch of courts and practitioners had been talking about useless words, additional words that are thrown in that don't have any value. We call them encrustations. Uh, Glenn West had this particularly wonderful article where he calls them sea squirts, which is a brainless, a, a, a creature in the sea that initially has a brain and then loses its brain, never goes away, which is he, his view of contract drafting. So we looked at the incrustations. In the next slide, we talked about uh, our uh, horse race. And I will turn it over to Steve to show how the horse race uh, manifests itself across a range of practice areas, including our m and and our own beloved sovereign debt. Thanks, me too, and uh, uh, it, it's really great to be able to present uh, today, uh, even, even remotely. So, so let me talk a little bit about our uh, empirical setup. So as me too mentioned, uh, we're focusing in particular on the governing law clause, uh, and, and we're looking at four different areas. We're looking at private equity m a where our sense is that uh, attorneys uh, are more uh, tightly bound to uh, the principles here of the private equity firm, so there perhaps is lower agency costs, uh, and uh, as well, there's, there's a lower, uh, I guess, uh, coordination costs among uh, the various participants here. We compare that against two other areas, and at the other extreme would be sovereign bonds, where we have higher agency costs, uh, lawyers uh, for the sovereign, for example, answer to debt managers, but the debt managers themselves are agents of the citizens of, of, or the, the residents of a particular country. So we call this sort of a double agency cause. The debt managers may not care so much about the long-term interests of the citizens, uh, and in turn, the attorneys therefore may not care so much. Um, so, so the argument here is that uh, we might expect greater innovation, greater attention to detail in the M&A context because agency costs are lower, as well, our coordination costs are lower as well. In corporate bonds, we look at both high yield and low yield, are somewhere in between. So given this, this range of uh, our hypothesis about responsiveness, we look at the non-contractual innovation. So as Mitya mentioned, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of uh, discussion from 2003, uh, 2009 to 2013. And we look at, well, are there differences between these different areas with different agency costs? 
in their responsiveness to, to this pressure to change or to add the non-contractual clause. And then we also look at uh, incrustations. To the extent attorneys are uh, diving into these uh, governing law clauses, uh, do we also see uh, uh, sort of these uh, other terms being added? And, and one mechanism by which this may take place could be cut and paste, uh, overly aggressive cut and paste, which both may increase the length of the governing law clause, as well as introduce these sort of uh, unnecessary terms that could act in the long term to provide uh, uh, some, some issues or problems uh, for these clauses. So with that in mind, uh, we have a data set. We, uh, uh, unfortunately, we can only start in 2010 due to uh, limitations on our data source, uh, but our data set runs from 2010 through 2020. And as Mitu said, we, we sort of looked at what happens in each of these uh, four areas. So here's our, our first uh, just sort of summary. Uh, so if I start in the upper left-hand corner, uh, these, uh, this shows for the uh, group of uh, private equity uh, bonds in our data set. And we collect about 25 to 30 per year from 2010 through 2020. Uh, what fraction of them have a non-contractual clause? You can see it starts at 15% in 2010. So at the beginning of our data set time period, there already were some, and particularly for the private equity deals, that had a non-contractual term uh, in the governing law clause. Um, but by 2020, it's 50%. So there is a, a, a relatively large shift uh, from 2010 through 2020. When we compare that to the other three areas, sovereign, which is at the other end of the scale in terms of higher agency costs, more difficulty in coordination to, uh, to affect change in these, these terms, uh, and then low yield and high yield corporate bonds, uh, with pretty much uh, very little change over time. So, so just looking at this, it does look like private equity is different, and there is a greater responsiveness to the pressure from 2009 through 2013 uh, that corresponds to uh, a growing incidence in these non-contractual terms. Now, we did do a statistical uh, test of this. We do a difference and difference model, where basically we're looking at the difference between private equity and everyone else. So we look at the difference in the period uh, from 2010 through 2012, so there's that initial difference, and they would look at how that difference changes. So that's a difference in difference, the initial difference, and then how much does that difference change uh, from 2013 onward, which we treat as the period after that initial pressure for change. So uh, I won't put up the numbers on this model, but when we do the model, uh, this particular interaction term in the model, so this is private equity, times 2013 onwards. So this is really the difference in difference. Uh, how much did the differential in incidence between private equity and everyone else, how much did that change uh, after all this pressure occurred from 2009 through 2013? Well, we saw as a 23.8 percentage point increase, and this was significant at the 1% uh, confidence level. So, and it meets the eye test. We see there this big shift, and indeed it is uh, statistically significant. So we take this as, as evidence that, uh, uh, that there was a change and that the, the change was in particular in the area where we would expect it, where the attorneys are, are, have the lowest agency costs and most responsive to the needs of their principal, in this case, the, the private equity firms. Now, just a couple of other things we did. Uh, if you look at the next slide, figure two, uh, one thing we wondered about was the, uh, the complexity of the governing law clause. So, so our thought was that, uh, and, and this is sort of a thought about attorney practice and drafting, uh, that attorneys rarely uh, remove existing language. I would perhaps have fear that they may be uh, uh, breaking something in the contract. Uh, instead, uh, if there's something new, typically it will be added just as, as an addition, more words. Um, so, so one of the things we looked at was just the length of the contracts and how that changed uh, across our time period of our study. And again, we sort of see a similar pattern. If you look at the upper left-hand corner, private equity starts with uh, more words than the, all the other uh, categories of the governing law clause. At least this is the governing law clause, just the raw number of words in the governing law clause. So already prior to the start of our study, uh, attorneys seem to have been tinkering with the governing law clause more in the private equity context. And then 2013 onward, you can see it's not a linear pattern. There's some variation here. We have different kinds of private equity firms uh, so, so across time. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but, but generally, it does go up. And uh, we do the same kind of difference and difference model comparing the private equity 
uh, uh, deals, the governing law clause length, with the other deals governing the law clause length, and how that difference changed uh, in the 2013 onward period. So, so the difference between these and these, uh, and then again the difference later on uh, between the two groups. And when we do that, uh, we find that there is a 60.6 uh, increase in the number of words, so 60 more words uh, in these clauses. Uh, and this again is significant at the 1% confidence level. So these clauses are growing larger, for the, in particular for the private equity, which again is consistent with the attorneys tinkering uh, with this clause. Now I think that the next figure is really what I, I think is sort of the interesting consequence of tinkering. When attorneys go in, and they change a clause, perhaps with good motive, uh, do other things change as well? So other things which are not necessarily related to the underlying reason uh, uh, for the change in the first place. So our change is the addition of the non-contractual term, but we see other things change as well. And as me too uh, mentioned, we call these encrustations, these are or cease words, as Glenn West calls these, uh, these are sort of unnecessary words which are added, which could lead to later litigation issues or, or uncertainties. So we do the same comparison. If you look at the upper left-hand corner, uh, uh, the private equity start with more, perhaps because there was prior tinkering before a data set. And then they go up uh, in, again, the 2013 onward. In particular, 2015, 2020, uh, we see uh, a greater uh, number of encrustations. So in our paper, we identify uh, 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 several of them uh, and, and we see there's about three on average, or three, three, two point five to three in this period, and much lower for the other other groups. So we did the same test, difference in difference, uh, and we find that significant at the five percent confidence level, a zero point three three increase in the number of encrustations. Now, just one last test, and this test uh, goes to this one observation about these different slides. In the private equity group, and we're in the difference in difference models, we're comparing the private equity against the three other types of deals, uh, we have a mixture of private equity firms. And indeed, across any particular year, the private equity firms could be different firms. So they, if they're all private equity in this chart, but uh, in this year, we could have Blackstone, and another year, we could have another private equity firm, a different one. So the, the, the mixture of firms may differ. And that could be uh, 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 adding some noise to our results. So our last test is we did a private equity firm fixed effects model. So to do this, we identify the top 15 private equity firms based on an exogenous ranking. Um, and then we collected all the deals by these top 15 firms. So Blackstone was one of our top 15 firms. And we basically look at Blackstone deals and compare Blackstone deals against Blackstone deals, looking again at the 2013 onward time period. So by looking at Blackstone against Blackstone, we we're controlling for Blackstone specific characteristics in a way which uh, this prior slide, there could be different private equity firms in these different time periods, which we may not be fully controlling for. So this type of model is basically comparing Blackstone against itself and see, see what happens over time. Uh, and do we see this shift after 2013? So uh, here I will put up some numbers. Uh, the first model is the presence of the non-contractual clause. The second model is the number of words, that's the complexity of the uh, clause. And the third one is the number of encrustations. And we control for deal amount, and here we have private equity firm fixed effects. And this is really the key results here. The 2000 onward coefficient indicates, was there a shift uh, for the private equity firm against itself? So a Blackstone against itself, was there a shift? What we find is uh, that there is an increase in the non-contractual clause. Uh, there is an increase in the number of words, 141 more words. And there's an increase in the number of encrustations, 0.526 uh, more encrustations. And the little asterisks next to those numbers indicate each one of those shifts was significant uh, at the 1% level. So, so we do find evidence that the market is responsive, uh, particularly the private equity firms are responsive to pressures to introduce a useful change in the governing law clause, the non-contractual term. Uh, uh, but we also find that this increases the overall length of the clause, which, you know, that that's not, isn't necessarily uh, so bad or good. It just means it's more complex, perhaps. But in that increase, we're seeing also encrustations, which could lead to later legal uh, trouble. Uh, so we're seeing both happen at the, at the same time. And, uh, and this is me too slide, but uh, uh, are M&A attorneys better? 
And I think it's it, it's uh, complicated. Yes, uh, yes, and no. Maybe me too can add some more. But those are our findings. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, me too. If you did have anything to uh, add at the uh, at the end, we'll we'll save it for Q and A then. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and uh, now, Professor uh, Lipson. Let me, let me just say something about implications. Um, Excellent. Just to make sure that I earn my uh, cup of coffee here. Uh, this is Bob Scott talking. Uh, one of the th important questions going forward with all of this research, um, which we've done in a number of areas and are continuing uh, to do uh, in even new papers, is to try to understand uh, what are the major influences that lead to this significant lag uh, uh, in between the time when a theory would tell you uh, a faithful lawyer will affect a change in order to protect the client against a um, untoward uh, interpretation of their contract, um, and the time when that change occurs, or in some cases, as you've seen, doesn't occur at all. Um, and the two convenient or at least plausible explanations uh, for that phenomenon are, uh, as Steve said, uh, are agency costs on the one hand, which suggests that there is just a differential in incentives between the parties who are doing the drafting, mostly lawyers, uh, and the, the uh, principals in this case, uh, and that the lawyers' incentives might well be, for example, uh, to do uh, to make less change because change is costly and I might not be uh, able to bill for all the effort that I put in. And this is consistent with a language in the literature which suggests that one of the agency problems is slack. It's a failure on the part of the agent to work as hard as the agent uh, would uh, otherwise want to be and the inability of the principal to monitor effectively. So that, that's a very convenient and familiar in the literature a trope that tries to explain uh, differences uh, in, in behavior. So that's one. But we've also explored in our prior work and in, in some new work an alternative explanation which may lead to the same result, but it's actually different in an important way. And that is the question of coordination. Maybe these agents are perfectly faithful individually but they face a collective action problem. And that is that on behalf of their client, if they were to act individually, they might actually expose their client to untoward risk. Uh, this would be true if, in, in any of these cases, the contract is standardized. If, in fact, there is what's known uh, by many uh, uh, of the lawyers that we talk to as market. And, and market means what the norms of the particular market believe to be the good uh, standard contract term. Now, in this alternative uh, uh, conception, the faithful attorney faces a coordination problem, and the faithful attorney is unable to act individually without exposing the client to unnecessary risks, but doesn't have the wherewithal because of the size of the market or its heterogeneity. Uh, to uh, work to effectively uh, coordinate a change that all would agree on and that, so, uh, and that, that would then successfully uh, solve the problem uh, in a standardized uh, way. And we have found those coordination problems particularly acute in the sovereign bond uh, world that we study in, in, other, in other work uh, and indeed experienced uh, ourselves uh, how it is that in a heterogeneous, heterogeneous, I can't pronounce the word too early in the morning here, um, way, uh, the, the, the parties are unable to affect coordination. And by, just by way of explanation of that, um, of that phenomenon, a, a useful point of comparison many of you may be familiar with is, uh, uh, is the ISTA market, um, dealing with derivatives, where you have a central hierarchy. What, you call in other work a, a spider in the web, in the network, uh, that can coordinate uh, changes effectively. 
everything we hear about how the ISDA market works is that, in fact, that coordination is successful, even though it's a very large, um, a very large um, um, market. And so one of the things that we would urge uh, people who are more expert than we are in, uh, in these transactions to think about uh, is ways in which we might be able to successfully separate uh, in an experimental way these two different theories in order to determine which one is more prevalent in one case than, uh, than uh, the other. And that, of course, is for us um, work uh, that we have uh, going forward. So, thank you. Great. Well, while they're getting the slides um, up, I'm Jonathan Lipson from Temple Law School. Um, and I want to start by thanking Juliet and Charlie and uh, Anant and Patty and the, the students and staff here. Um, it's, it's great to be here um, for a bunch of reasons. It's great to hear what Jill has to say. It's great to hear what Me Too and, and, and Stephen and, and Bob have to say. Um, it'll be great to hear what Juliet and others um, have to say. These folks are like all my heroes. And, and um, for those of you who know me, there are two things that are true about me. The first is that I'm kind of a, a dilettante. I can't really make any choices. So I, I dabble in corporate. I dabble in contract. I dabble in corporate reorganization. And so I know nothing about any of them, um, which doesn't stop me from talking about those things or teaching those things. But it does mean you should take everything I have to say with a grain of salt. Number two, I'm terrible at following directions. And so I gave. Juliet, a uh, title for a paper, I think maybe even a draft, of a paper called The Ends of Corporate Social Responsibility. But then it changed. And, and so the slides that you see are um, about a paper called Against Corporate Social Responsibility, which is slightly different, slightly snarkier, same basic point. Um, so I obviously you know, will tell you, you know, kind of what that means and why I'm not really against corporate social responsibility. Um, but I am, of course, against empty rhetoric about you know, pro-social market forces and beliefs in what those things can do. Um, and about naivete, I'm against naivete about the work that law can do here. So three claims in the paper. The first is that um, I, I think basically there is no law of corporate social responsibility. CSR is a legal nothing. It is nearly aspirational, as the you know, court said in the Walmart case, um, a pious wish. To uh, that something nice will come out of it, Burley said in 1932, right? It feels good, but it is not law in any meaningful sense. Um, number two, uh, if you care about pro social market forces and harnessing law to get them to do something, get them to do ESG sorts of things, you might want to think more about contract. And, and so, contract social responsibility is a legal maybe. Um, it might be the case that contract terms that do these things are enforceable. It might be the case that they have other extra legal benefits. Um, but number three, both of these things, contract social responsibility and corporate social responsibility, are, I think, significantly limited by a bunch of things, including risks of co-optation and fragmentation. Um, this is all part of a larger project that I've been working on over the past four or five years, focusing on contract social responsibility. Um, there some papers that have already been written, and this one has been in process for several years. And I started to think about it all when I saw the story in the New York Times about Frances McDormand's Oscar speech in 2018, when she says, I leave you with two words, inclusion writer. And of course, what that meant was she wanted actors in Hollywood to use their market power to induce studios to enhance diversity on the movie set by including you know, writers to that effect in their in their, in their, in their, in their uh, uh, contracts with the studios. And I was like, well, that's weird. Like, why would you think contracts should do the work of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Obviously, she sort of suggests that, that that is the case. So the more I thought about it, the less it made sense, the less I understood about it. And, and so my motivation you know, takes uh, so the sort of four pieces to it, I guess. First, it's just understudied. There are seven million papers on corporate social responsibility, in law, in finance, in business, in sociology, in anthropology, everybody has something to say about CSR. There are about six papers on contract social responsibility. Two of them are mine, and those aren't very good. So like, there's a lot more to say here, because I think that the truth is that this is where the rubber will meet the road for many, many, many private actors seeking to affect 
pro-social change. Number two, um, it's an invitation, I think, to assess or reassess larger questions about the interaction between the public and the private. As private actors or kind of naively understood private actors gain power, multinational corporations gain power, they're going to take on public duties and public responsibilities, sensibilities that I think will challenge how we think about the interaction of those two phenomena, those two, those two concepts. It's also an invitation to reassess the scope and goals of CSR itself. Um, you know, as I say, I don't think that it's really the law. And number four, it's an invitation to reassess the scope and goals of contract theory and doctrine. Um, you know, one of us, um, one of the folks on the earlier panel um, is the author of a, you know, a great paper, lots of great papers on contracts. Um, Scott and Schwartz in 2003 say, well, look, the contract is, 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 is it's characterized by three features. It's bilateral, it's a political, private and p political, and it's just about economic gain. Um, you know, it's dyadic, they say. It's law should facilitate the efforts of contracting parties to maximize their joint gains and nothing else. And part of, I think, what we're observing in the use of contract terms to get Frances McDormand the diversity she wants is contract attempting to do something else. So with the time that I have left, I'll just you know, cover three things. Number one, no law of CSR. Number two, law of KSR might exist. There might be a law of contract social responsibility. And in any case, I think there are extra legal benefits um, to using contract. Um, but there are also reasons for caution, and there are questions that I think we can ask about all this, the most basic of which involve the reality that to the extent we're asking private order to do public work, right, we are then inevitably going to import the public policy fights that we would otherwise see elsewhere. So to put it very simply, like my pro-social goals may not be yours. And whether private ordering mechanisms like contract or corporate law are particularly suited to address those conflicts, I think ends up being an interesting question. So why do I say CSR is a legal nothing? Well, because I think it has been set up in opposition to the problem of shareholder primacy, which I also think by and large is not really the law. I mean, I absolutely agree with, with Jill that it's a really interesting thing to think about whether Revlon imposes a duty to maximize profit um, for the benefit of shareholders. Certainly, this is what Freeman taught us, that that is the one and only social responsibility of businesses. Although he later had a kind of, you know, reawakening or whatever. He had a sort of second thoughts about that. But, you know, my, one of my heroes, Lynn Lopucky, has a 2022 paper where he says, well, it is the law of Delaware, right? The you know, law of Delaware requires directors of uh, corporations to maximize the benefit of, um, the, maximize wealth of the corporation for the benefit of shareholders. Um, I'm not entirely sure that's true, right? So, you know, Bob Ree has a paper where he says, it's absolutely true, right? It is Delaware law. The law requires that shareholders, that directors maximize economic value for the benefit of shareholders, full stop. Lynn Stout, of course, we know, you know, said, well, not so sure. There are lots of things going on here. And, you know, this is obviously a robust debate. It connects in some ways to the, you know, collective versus, uh, you know, individualized framing that, that Jill was talking about earlier. Um, but certainly, there's no statute that says this, right? I mean, Joan Hemingway, among many others, says, look, you know, no statute says it. And the case law, once you leave the world of Revlon, is decidedly, you know, wishy-washy on this. I think the closest you get, um, at least that I've found, is the Craigslist case, right? Where, you know, Chancellor Chandler says, um, in the context of a privately held company, you basically, like, look, you can't enact defensive measures that might inhibit shareholder maximization just to protect a corporate culture that feels good, you know, for whatever pro-social things you might have in mind. There's nothing about Craigslist corporate culture, he says, that Time, you know, or Unical protects because giving away services to attract business is a sales tactic. It's not a corporate culture. And Leo, right, Strine says, yeah, that's right. You know, Newmark, the Craigslist case, it is Hornbook law. Well, maybe in Hornbooks, but it's not actually in the case law, so far as I can tell, outside of the decision by directors to auction off the company. And, you know, realistically, even, you know, any, any defensive mechanism you could come up with, you know, with adequate lawyering, I think probably would survive. So one way to read the Craigslist case is that it's about the lawyers and not about the law. Um, shareholder primacy matters because it's been held as being in opposition to corporate social responsibility. There's a law of primacy that prevents us from realizing the aspirations of corporate social responsibility. And so if you think that's true, then you would think there ought to be a law 
to fix it. And so that's exactly what legal entrepreneurs like Rick Alexander and, and Bill Clark, who are you know, friends of mine from the ABA, have done. They developed a model benefit corporation statute, and they have shopped it around to the states. Um, the basic intuition, as, as the discussion earlier suggests, is that you, know, you can have a corporation whose charter says, you know, provides for a general public benefit. A, you know, a material, the corporation will make a material positive impact on society and the environment taken as a whole. And we now you know, are perfectly comfortable with this idea. Um, but of course, when you inspect these statutes, in particular Delaware's, right, as Jill was suggesting earlier, like, there is a lot less here than meets the eye. Right? What are directors of benefit corporations supposed to do in Delaware? Balance and report. Right? That's about it. Well, that's, you know, I balance the financial goals against the social goals. Fine. I have no idea what that could possibly mean. I have no idea what a court is supposed to do if somebody's grumpy about how the balancing was performed. Even the reporting, okay, so you're supposed to do the reporting, but as you'll see in a moment, like the sanctions for failing, mm, not really clear what those are. Obviously, the big issue here is the final period transaction, and so you know, we worry about the sale of the benefit corporation to a buyer who might not, in fact, honor the public benefit purpose, defeating the expectations of the shareholders you know, who invested in the social cause, um, sort of the equal and opposite of the conversion of the you know, for-profit to the you know, traditional C corporation to a benefit. Um, but really, there aren't many prohibitions there. Delaware started out super restricted. You needed like 90% of the shareholders to agree to a sale. Now, you know, between 2015 and 2020, amendments in Delaware, like, eh, we don't care. Like, any, basically, they can sell to whomever on whatever theory they have. Again, assuming, I guess, that they've done the balancing that they're supposed to do. The Model Act um, is a little more restrictive. You need a shareholder, two-thirds shareholder vote to sell it by way of merger, um, you know, to... Uh, you know, any, anybody else to, I guess, help protect the public benefit purpose. But of course, you could still do an asset sale, if, you know, get 51% of the voter, the shareholders to agree to that. So not super, not super restrictive. Um, we're not protecting the public benefit purpose a lot. And of course, even if we thought the law did that, what if the directors just don't do what the law seems to say? Well, there's not much risk, right? You know, d &O liability here has been, I think, minimized to you know, virtually nothing, right? The directors and officers have a duty to balance you know, the, the sort of the pecuniary and, and social goals um, you know, in, in basically an informed and disinterested way, you know, consistent with you know, that the, undertaken by an ordinary person of sound judgment. So like, unless you're nuts, right, your directors are nuts, then you know, whatever they do is fine and they're not going to be liable. So, you know, takeaway point is pretty clear. Like, I don't think there's a law of corporate social responsibility. I'm not sure there's a law of shareholder primacy. I think it's great marketing. I think CSR can do lots of wonderful things. I think it's not the law, right? What might be the law? Well, contract. So I've defined in other papers con this idea of contract social responsibility as being one or more written terms in an instrument that purports to be an enforceable contract um, that seeks explicitly to achieve some kind of social economic or environmental responsibility goals, ESG goals, I guess, um, that is supplemental to or independent of existing substantive legal or regulatory obligations um, through the performance of the terms. Um, four things that contract can do that corporate law cannot do. Number one, specification. Number two, flow through. Number three, monitoring. Number four, remedy. What do I mean? Specification. So one of the reasons I got, other reasons I got interested in this is that my friends at the ABA have been working on model contract clauses to, in fact, achieve things like protections for labor in multinational supply chain agreements, to achieve environmental protections in you know, those and other kinds of contracts, um, all through highly articulated, specified schedules that would be appended to supply chain agreements or really any kind of, of contract. And this is an ongoing effort by the ABA. And it's super interesting, but they didn't invent it. Francis McDormand didn't invent it. I'm not sure General Motors invented it, but this is the, the, the provision that that Chris Johnson, you know, who used to be the GC of North America, came up with back in like the 80s or 90s. He said, you know, neither any, nobody who sells to GM can use slaves or forced labor. If you, if you sell to GM, you have to, you, you are promising that you didn't use and, you know, slaves or, or, or forced labor to, 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 to make a product. Um, HP has environmental terms in its standard supply agreement. The oldest example that I found, the Beatles in 1964, they come to the States, they find that the South is segregated, they don't like this, 
They come back in 65 and they say to the Gator Bowl, if you want us to perform, you have to agree not to be segregated. So their, their standard form performance agreement says the Beatles will not be required to perform before a segregated audience. And the Gator Bowl integrated for that concert, which is incredible. Um, so that's specification, right? Corporate law can do none of that, right? CSR is statements of policy affecting the organization. Um, by contrast, contract can flow through, right? Which this is a slightly complicated idea, but the idea is that if you have, right, in the center of this spider web, if you will, you have the kind of multinational corporation, to the left you have the suppliers. The tier one suppliers will make the promises I just described. No slaves, not, no dumping in the, you know, in the Cuyahoga, whatever, whatever good things you want them to do. But of course you worry that they're gonna subcontract all the dirty stuff to other people further up the chain, right? Because that's the only way they can afford to actually make this stuff. So you force the tier one supplier to get their promisors, their suppliers and sub-suppliers to make the same promise. And so this social responsibility specification flows through the supply chain contract. And these can, I mean, these can, you know, run many, 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 many nodes. It's super complicated stuff. So, right, specification, flow through monitoring, right? How do we know that the supplier, the sub-supplier, whoever, tier seven, you know, folks are doing this well, the contracts will provide for monitoring. There's a whole sort of ESG due diligence industry that's arisen, questions about whether it works. Fourth and finally, contracts specify, can specify remedy, right? Corporate law doesn't specify a remedy. Okay, maybe appraisal is a remedy, but like not really one that's going to be helpful in any social responsibility sense. So, you know, one of the things that the kind of newest iteration of the, the ABA terms is focusing on is the idea that we'll have remedies tailored to the social responsibility purpose. So if it turns out that a supplier or sub-supplier was using forced labor or was dumped, whatever bad thing they were doing, right, rather than just having them pay liquidated damages to General Motors or HP, they actually have to remediate and they'll have a remediation plan developed with the buyer. And if damages are paid, the damages go to remediation, not just to, you know, help GM, which is interesting because there will be reputational costs to GM, you know, as we all learned from the Rana Plaza disaster. Fine, so that's contract, maybe better, maybe more effective than, than corporate law here. But I still think there are limitations. I think there are reasons for caution. We shouldn't be exuberant, too exuberant about any of this stuff. Um, number one, there are empirical limitations, um, right? Both in terms of practice in the real world, right? I think Jody Short and some other folks, you know, did the study and they're like, well, actually the, you know, the, 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 the due diligence ESG industry, they actually don't know much and they can't know much for a bunch of reasons because you're never gonna find the guys who are actually making the stuff. Um, and you're never actually going to find the guys who are dumping. So like, don't get your hopes up. Um, and this has an effect on, on the project because like, I'm trying to develop an empirical strategy here, so I'd love some guidance on that. There are also institutional limitations, right? If we think that contract or corporate law should be doing the work of, say, environmental regulators or the EEOC, like, what do we do when it turns out that like, you know, we, we actually care, still care about the political and realm, right? We want government and public actors to, to you know, sort of do these things. But there's no single institutional solution, as Komisar would tell us, um, to any of these problems. Um, relatedly is the problem of fragmentation and division, right? So, like, I think what Frances McDormand wants is good. She wants diversity on the movie set. Well, Mel Gibson might have a very different view, right? And he might want to harness his market power to get an exclusion rider. What's to stop him, right? Well, maybe not today's Supreme Court. Like, I don't really know. But these are all politically contested things, is the point. And there's no reason to think that that political contest evaporates just because you're running it through corporation or contract law. Um, number three, I think you have problems of co-optation. So Orla LaBelle talks a lot about how formal law in any setting can you know, really drain you know, radical movements, political movements of, of life. And you know, I think if that's true of formal law you know, in the public setting, it's probably true of formal contracts as well. So we need to be kind of alert. If we actually think this works, we need to be alert to assuming that it actually works. And you know, I think there's reason to you know, think it might, but don't get too excited. Um, and you know, just more con most concretely, like, well, what if General Motors knows that they're slaves in the supply chain, but they don't enforce the, responsible, the socially responsible promise because they need their Chevy Volts and they have to sell their stuff and they just have to turn you know, and look the other way for a little bit. Um, no guarantee they enforce. And then, you know, priority in a downturn, number four. Like, okay, well, in the next two years, we're gonna learn, I think, a little bit about how serious people really are. What are you really willing to pay for social responsibility? Because there is no free lunch. 
So the you know kind of conclusion is straightforward. Like I do think contract is is there's a lot of work to do here. I think there's a lot of really interesting and important things to understand about the the role of contract in achieving these aspirations. Um, you know things like specification monitoring, so on. I think provide evidence that it is probably more plausible than corporate governance law, but none of it's perfect, right? None of it's great, uh, or at least none of it's optimal. And so, you know, we can never assume that these are complete solutions. Um, other institutions obviously matter, and, 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 and so how those in institutions that interact with these institutions, I think, ends up being, you know, one of the really interesting questions. I guess we'll take questions at the end, so I'll hold for now, but thank you all very much. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm Julia Kostritsky. Um, for those of you who don't know me, but I want to tell you that I'm thrilled to be part of this symposium and to be on a panel with such wonderful scholars as Me Too, Bob, Stephen, and Jonathan. And I also want to announce that I'm presenting for my co authors, Jillian Fox um, and Blake Spiller. So the title of my talk is ESG Fiduciary Law and Private Ordering A New Perspective. And again, environmental social governance for those who are um, not in the know. So there's been a lot of pressure on corporations to take ESG into account. I'm not using my slides. I won't use my slides. Um, you'll thank me for not using my slides. Okay. So um, there's a lot of pressure um, on corporations to take ESG into account. But there's a lack of clarity on the meaning of ESG. There's uncertainty about also whether following ESG will help or hurt uh, firms financially. So this paper is going to analyze various styles of ESG provisions under contract and corporate law. And a warning, I'm a contract scholar, not a corporate law scholar. So I want to see if they're enforceable under contract law and would they violate the duty of loyalty under corporate law and would a waiver be permissible or desirable? So some clauses that you find on ESG um, in investor rights agreements or shareholder agreements fall within sort of the traditional um, risk compliance realm. And they seem innocuous, such as the com company shall use commercially reasonable efforts to comply with applicable environmental, social, and governance laws and regulations. So those fit within perhaps traditional risk assessment. But <clears throat> at this stage, um, what if proposals went beyond these types of um, provisions for risk management or legal compliance? Um, and there is some evidence that the shareholder proposals today are pushing for um, a sacrifice in uh, reduction of uh, shareholder value. Hart and Zingales point to the fact that shareholders seem to be pushing companies to do things that might reduce value. Um, but uh, I'm a little skeptical because um, I'm not sure that we can really ascertain that from these proposals. The same uncertainty about the meaning of ESG and possible trade-offs that would be required um, persists. So um, I'm not sure we know um, whether these shareholder pr proposals uh, are pushing for a reduction in value. Um, so what are some of these sources of uncertainty about the meaning of ESG? So does a pursuit of ESG mean that stakeholder values can be pursued at the expense of shareholder value? Um, what are the effects of climate change on firm value? Um, some economists like Robert Pindick suggests that you know, there, there's a lot of uncertainty in the models. Um, there's a lack of clarity on how we're going to manage different classes of investors. And <clears throat> there are um, still uncertain effects on firm value. Um, Elizabeth Pullman, in a recent paper, identifies other uncertainties uh, in the ESG realm, including tension between different prongs of ESG, um, such as between labor and environmental. Um, so. I um, started with a proposed contract term that um, would maybe squarely pose some of these issues. Um, what if a proposed contract um, sample clause would permit to 
managers to pursue various forms of CSR, including ESG, in spite of traditional stockholder wealth maximization and fiduciary duties. Well, what about a contract term like that, wherever it appears in a charter or a shareholder agreement? Would that be proscribed under contract law? So I think some of the contract uh, aspects of these clauses are under-theorized. Um, and so I'm going to look at that. So even if we take as a starting point a deference to contractual freedom based on the corporation as a nexus of contracts, um, I still think there are a lot of issues about enforceability. So um, obviously, as a starting point, contract requires uh, contract law requires consent to the terms. The ambiguity on the term ESG may preclude true consent to any of a broad-based ESG term. Um, so the ambiguity in the ESG term renders consent problematic. How can the shareholder, if it is in a shareholder agreement, know what he's investing in or whether to exit without knowing uh, the meaning of ESG and how managers will pursue ES ESG and at what cost and with what effects on firm value. <coughs> so, um, and if we were pursuing the contract line of analysis, we might also be concerned that a broad term of the kind I described at the beginning is too indefinite to be enforceable. So traditionally, contract law refuses to enforce contract terms that are too indefinite. And here, there are possibly distinct meanings of ESG, either that they're mandated to pursue ESG directors at the, even at the cost of shareholder value, or that directors can pursue ESG only if it advances shareholder value. And there's no trade usage or common practice to resolve the meaning, so a court might refuse um, to enforce a term like that. Um, and then, um, again, with contract analysis, um, would it be illegal and against public policy? Um, and that's a constraint on the enforcement of contracts. So a court might refuse to give effect to the contract provision because it would cause the firm to depart from the permitted objective of shareholder wealth maximization. Um, and it might, uh, the court might also refuse to enforce a provision that might be construed as a broad uh, fiduciary waiver. So contract interpretation of these clauses, um, should that, that would be a, another issue that might come up. Um, a court would have to confront whether a contract provisi provision should be interpreted to permit the sacrifice of shareholder value how would a court choose between an instrumental versus a pluralistic interpretation, as Babchuk and uh, Tallarita refer to in their illusory promise uh, article? It would be hard to know. Um, and <clears throat> the uh, organizational imperative to control opportunism and agency costs um, might be one factor that would help us in contract interpretation. Under that imperative, courts should prefer an interpretation of ESG that would curb managerial opportunism, and that would suggest no broad clauses for the pursuit of ESG. Um, there might be another contract issue, and that is the need to avoid any conflict with statutes. Um, so if ESG is interpreted as a mandate to pursue, ESG is an independent value that could trump shareholder value, that might run afoul of Delaware corporate law or Delaware statutes. Um, so, um, and in those situations, when confronted with a contract provision, courts would strive to interpret the provision to avoid a conflict. Now, even though I'm not a corporate law scholar, I wanted to delve into um, the analysis of a broad provision for ESG under a corporate analysis. So, um, and we learned so much from um, Jill Fish's talk this morning. Um, not surprisingly, did we learn a lot. So, um, although corporate analysis um, talks about the nexus of contracts, Jensen and Meckling, the contracts in corporate law are different. They involve trust. Within our ordinary arm's length transaction in contract law, um, in which you, if one in which you bought services, you would not be talking about lingering performance obligations or conflict of interest provisions. 
So I think a special um, analysis requ is required of those contract provisions um, within f uh, fiduciary law um, and fiduciary duty laws. So under, traditional, uh, under the traditional view, in a non-constituency jurisdiction, the shareholders, um, the stakeholders' interests, I'm sorry, should enter only as an instrumental means of achieving um, shareholder wealth or firm value. And there are you know, sound reasons why, under a law and economic lens, the exclusive beneficiaries of the fiduciary duty uh, should be the shareholders, since, as Jonathan Macy says, sharing assets with non-owners would cause a decline in value for which shareholders should be compensated. So, um, so we're on this path of trying to figure out whether um, a clause of the kind that I talked about, which is a broad <coughs> authorization to pursue ESG, would pose problems for um, the fiduciary duty analysis. And um, it may be that um, <laughs> it may be hard to tell uh, if there is a conflict between um, the pursuit of ESG in a broad clause and fiduciary duty. Um, because the business judgment rule will mean that fiduciaries can often hide their actions from investors. So does it really matter that there's a conflict if it can't be discovered? Some scholars say, like it, such as Jonathan um, Povolonis in the Use and Misuse of Fiduciary Duties article, says it doesn't really matter. Um, so if, because... <laughs> um, it doesn't really matter if you identify a breach of fiduciary duty because it's going to be hidden under the business judgment rule. But for reasons that I'm going to come to, it, I think that it does matter um, to be able to identify whether there is a breach. Okay, so um, uh, um, is a <laughs> what are some of the bad effects um, of mandating the pursuit of ESG um, in this broad uh, way in a contract clause. Um, so because the undifferentiated ESG provision would, under one interpretation, mean the director could consider stakeholder value, um, but only for promoted shareholder value, um, and, and the other is the reverse, um, it's hard to tell whether um, this is a violation. But nonetheless, the, the problem is that um, that it poses, that this kind of broad clause, is that sorting by ESG preferences may be impossible or imperfect given the variegated and difficult to communicate preferences and the need to monitor ESG. And um, I think that lack of sorting of um, investors is a significant problem. Um, and it won't be solved by contract law of the type that I talked about, a provision that um, gives broad authority to pursue uh, ESG in an undifferentiated sense. So in, in, as part of this um, fiduciary duty analysis, I think that you also have to, um, not only is it hidden, maybe the violation's there, but it's hidden, um, we can't really tell, but um, <clears throat> we also need to, think about um, agency costs and ESG. I mean, the final part of any fiduciary analysis um, has to be an assessment of what strategies, private or public, would best achieve the party's goals at the lowest cost, you know, citing Oliver Williamson, among others. Um, so you start with the problems that shareholders face, and that is shirking, um, or opportunism by managers, and collectively these are agency costs. So a law, the law supplies a fiduciary duty to constrain that opportunism when parties face insuperable obstacles um, to contract, to controlling these um, costs by contract. Um, so these are not ordinary contracts, but ones um, governed by the fiduciary duty. And the thing that we want to sort of ask ourselves in ask ourselves when we um, contemplate a contract clause that would authorize the pursuit broadly of ESG is how does the provision of an ambiguous ESG term hinder or help the constraining of opportunism? Um, and the answer to that, I think, um, is going to help us decide 
whether or not we are going to defer um, to that term or whether we are not going to defer to that type of contract term. So um, <clears throat> there's certainly other means of control of agency costs, and um, Bob Thompson wrote about them in an earlier article of his. Um, and we're familiar with them, um, but um, pricing of shares. Um, uh, the problem is, or other types of um, managerial controls, um, the problem is the ambiguity or the uncertainty about the meaning of ESG um, is going to hinder that pricing, and it's going to hinder other <laughs> um, private control devices to, um, to curb opportunism. So we won't know whether, um, for example, in trying to determine whether or not the managers are doing a good job or not um, <clears throat> in controlling opportunism, um, we won't know whether the manager has the latitude to sacrifice value. So we can't judge how to price the shares. We can't, um, we can't tell whether he's a, the manager is doing a good job or not because we don't know what his, um, what he's undertaken to do in the pursuit of ESG to the extent that it's vague. Um, if you had um, other another control like an independent board, then you come back to the same problem about monitoring behavior of managers. If the monitoring is going to be hampered by um, the lack of content or the ambiguity in the term. Um, ESG. <clears throat> I think the um, ambiguity in the term will also complicate um, the duty of loyalty, the duty of care, and good faith. How can a fiduciary fulfill his duty of care when there's so much uncertainty about the data on the effects of climate change or ESG on firm performance and firm value? How will the duty of care um, be fulfilled? Can a manager in, be in good faith if he takes an action such as Ford took in committing to the end of gas combustion engines? Is that decision the death knell of Ford? Are the managers in effect sacrificing the entire asset pool even if they won't say so out loud? Um, <clears throat> and even with a low level scrutiny with BJR, um, business judgment rule managers might be liable. Um, <clears throat> is the Adoption of an ESG provision similar to a corporate opportunity waiver um, that we should follow. Um, and Gabrielle um, and Rattleberg and Eric Talley have written about this. There's sometimes compelling efficiency advantages from a particular type of waiver, such as for the duty of loyalty for a corporate opportunity waivers. Um, <clears throat> although previously the waiver of a corporate opportunity <coughs> ex ante would be regarded as a breach of the duty of loyalty. Now, under a new Delaware statute, the waiver would be valid. So, um, and uh, <coughs> Rauterberg and Talley offer um, some efficiency explanations for um, the corporate opportunity waiver. Um, in, in return for giving up the right to pursue selected opportunities for the firm, the firm <coughs> would gain cheaper financing or other benefits, and they make a compelling case for those efficiency advantages. So should we sanction <coughs> the pursuit of ESG in a contract term, recognizing that it might be a violation of the duty of loyalty, potentially, depending on how the term is interpreted, but then say, oh, well, there could be efficiency advantages to allowing it in a similar vein to um, allowing um, the uh, waiver of the corporate opportunity uh, loyalty duty. But um, should we make an exception? Should we carve out an exception um, here the way Delaware did with the corporate opportunity waiver? Well, n my answer to that is probably no. The uncertainty as to the meaning would burden courts and the uncertainty would act as a drag on gains from trade. It's hard to see how beneficial exchanges could take place given the lack of certainty about the meaning. Um, <clears throat> and it's also hard to see how um, parties could achieve the level of clarity normally required for the waiver of a mandatory duty of loyalty. So, <clears throat> so what are some <laughs> of the um, strategies for uh, solving you know, this problem? So um, either private um, 
strategies or uh, interventional strategies. So um, one strategy <clears throat> suggested by Hart and Zingales, well, we could just you know, rely on voting. We can leave it up to shareholders. They themselves identify some problems with a voting strategy um, if it's not a yes-no situation. Um, <clears throat> and other problems remain with a voting strategy. Scott Hurst points out that managers may need to act before the votes can actually be taken. Um, and can the, my question will be, can the uh, board follow the shareholder vote if the, remaining, and if, if the meaning remains unclear even to shareholders? Um, a private response to this problem of uh, the ambiguity or the un lack of clarity is depoliticized uh, investments. So one response to the lack of clarity on ESG um, is, and the extent to which firms are going to sacrifice financial value to promote ESG, is the development of funds that are specifically depoliticized and emphasize that they will only consider factors in their investment strategy uh, that impact uh, financial perform uh, perf that impact financial performance and not other um, considerations. So that's a private, non-interventional response to the lack of clarity um, in the term ESG. It's a form of anti-ESG um, pushback. Um, another, okay, so um, other alternatives. Um, Saul Levmore has a safe harbor. He wants to know, he wants uh, investors to know how the firm trades off shareholder value for ESG causes. Um, so. What are some of the other solutions? Some of them, um, and I don't really have an answer to, to the, which of these is best, but I think all of them are, are important in trying to solve the sorting problem. Um, and the ES, <coughs> the you know the Federal Securities and Exchange Commission, um, in their uh, recent proposal on the naming of funds, you know goes some way toward um, solving the sorting problem. Um, another. Um, response would be that we should forbid at the state law level in some way contract provisions to mandate the pursuit of ESG without a further definition of meaning. Um, we could require the disclosure of potential adverse effects on shareholder, shareholder value maximization um, and create a safe harbor for doing so. That's Saul Levmore's suggestion. We could require a provision like uh, Professor Fish's that concentrated disclosure by management um, of the effect of ESG on firm performance. Um, I think another thing that we need to do is require disclosure uh, of the uncertainties on the effects of pursuing ESG, require more data on the connection between ESG and firm performance before management can fulfill its duty of care. Um, and another, <laughs> that my final um, question or that I want to leave you with is, um, I don't think we can really um, look at these ESG clauses solely from a contract or a corporate law perspective. Um, we need to determine if these clauses are the best means of solving firm externalities without introducing other costs. Um, and I want to leave you with those costs. What are the costs of ESG clauses? that are undifferentiated and broad? Is it going to increase the cost of ownership? Will it, it by increasing agency costs, by reducing accountability of managers, um, would it prevent companies from going public because of all of these um, burdens? Would it fail to uh, sort investors according to preference, resulting in a heterogeneity of investors? Would, be there, would there be other costs to such clauses, and are these ESG, and here I sort of would differ with Jonathan, um, are these ESG contract clauses or is contract law itself the best way to address firm externalities? And I would sort of conclude, uh, no, not at this time, not with the ambiguity that resides in that term. And I'm going to end there and I'm going to turn it over to um, everyone for questions. Yeah, you should stay up there. Uh, I was I was not entirely successful with my moderation. We only have 15 minutes now for uh, for questions, but uh, uh, I'll 
I have some, I'd ask, but uh, I'd turn it over to the room and to the panelists themselves. So first, yeah, Professor Lipsum. Um, yeah, thank you, Dave. It's great. I'm going to start with, um, uh, I think, you two and his crew. Um, I thought it's a super interesting project. Obviously, I love all of these projects that look at what lawyers are actually doing. Um, in part because I used to be a lawyer, in part because I do a lot of stuff with the ADA. So the, the first thought um, is really this question. Is your model controlling for changes of law firms? Um, and the reason I ask is because you know, one could easily imagine that if you know a particular if Blackstone or whomever changes firms, um, the new firm is going to want to show off and show Blackstone that they've done something that appears to be inefficient, and they're going to have some words to do it. Um, one can imagine all sorts of effects of changing firms. I suspect you do look at it, but if not, that might be useful. Relatedly, practitioner networks. I think Nietzsche and I have talked about this before, but you know, the ABA has an incredibly robust um, M&A group that produces something called deal points, which is something that purports to be market for particular M&A-related terms. I don't know if they're analogous practitioner networks in the world of sovereign debt or low yield or even is that. The whole point of this was to keep the lawyers out of the room, right? Uh, so I don't know, you know, if, if, if to what extent that might help explain some of the differences that you see or even how you measure it, but it might be worth thinking about. Um, so those are just some questions. Number two, you, I think the claim is that adding words through the incrustation or, or what have you might increase um, litigation risk, uh, increase uncertainty. And of course, that's possible, but it's also possible that at least the lawyers perceive that it will reduce litigation risk or reduce uncertainty. And so I suppose it's possible to study at least the litigation piece of this empirically, although your sample size might be four um, you know, cases. I don't know how, 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 how effective the strategy could be. I mean, then the, the third and final point is I, I love your anecdote, me too, about you know, the students saying, well, this doesn't sound like innovation to me. Like, I'm right, like Christensen, and I know what the innovation looks like, and this doesn't look like that. And I think that's right. I mean, it's more like legal perseveration that I think you're finding you know, the lawyers engaging in, and for perhaps good reason. But it's really hard right, to characterize it as innovative in most cases. So that's it. Thank you. What? There you go. Yeah. So the, the attorney part is a good one. Uh, we do. Uh, we have the data on the attorneys. We didn't find that the. Uh, the, the top attorneys were associated with, with the, the shifts, um, but uh, but yeah, we, we probably can do a little bit more with the attorneys that into the to, to these tests. So, uh, on that, attorney networks, um, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how we would figure out what the networks are. I mean, we sort of looked at which which were the top attorneys uh, and see whether they were associated. And that, I, I think that's that's at least as I can see what we can do. If, if there's some exogenous way we can identify these networks, um, I, I think that'd be great. But I'm not quite sure how to do that. But, but I think it's a, it's a great suggestion. Um, hi, this we, is another. We, you've got a microphone coming here. This is an unbeg. This is great. So I have several questions um, to uh, to you and also um, to our other panelists that are here. I'll start with uh, the Scott uh, Gulati and Choi group. Uh, I was wondering, did you look at all at regional advantage? What do I mean by that? You know, in, um, there's a lot of literature on the fact that venture capital investments change from region to region. I'm wondering, do you see any changes with regards to M&A, uh, depending on uh, your geographic locations or not? Two, I will say, uh, again, from my limited experience when I used to practice m and it was funny, I always tell my students, one of my uh, first interviews, they put me in front of a contract, which although I studied theory, I had no clue how a contract looked like. And they told me, what would you change here? And the worst thing you could do is take a pen and pencil and tell a lawyer what to change. I started marking the document until a junior associate told me, what are you doing? <laughs> You should say that it's perfect. I'm like, there are archaic provisions here. They said, yeah, but we keep them. We worked really hard on these archaic provisions. So the second question would be, do you even see any contractual innovation? And if so, how is it driven? Uh, for example, in, in, again, in venture capital, you have the NVCA, the National Venture Capital Association, and they're really driving the standardization that we're seeing. So I'm wondering if an M&A were now have a similar body that does this. And the second and third questions are 
to Kostutsky and Lipson, thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to hear a little more on um, your opinions on whether we can put it in contract or not. First of all, I think it's fascinating, okay? I think there's need for that. I haven't seen much on ESG and contracts, so this is great. Um, so uh, I would love to kind of put you in, in, against each other and, and try to convince us yes or no in that respect. Thank you. Why don't we let our uh, remote panelists respond first? Because we can always spill over into lunch here. So, uh, but uh, we'll. Uh, I'm going to not answer the uh, regional question. That's for Steve. But I am going to uh, talk a little bit about innovation. And I agree with me too. A, a title for this paper had the word innovation. And maybe uh, we will, uh, we're correct in discarding it. Although I told me too, I don't know that I'm wedded to our MA lawyers better than uh, others. Um, but uh, the in interesting question, really, for me, because I, some of you know, do a lot of work on contract innovation, um, is that the setting seems to make uh, a, a huge difference in whether there is innovation or, or not. Um, and one way to think about that is to distinguish between uh, bespoke and standardized sets of transactions. I think the area in which innovation typically occurs and has occurred over time in history uh, is when the transactions uh, initially are, are bespoke. Uh, the classic example today, of course, is uh, collaborative contracting, what I and my co-authors have called contracting for innovation. Um, and you see uh, the classic example today, the one that we're all grateful for is the success of Pfizer and BioNTech, which uh, uh, developed the vaccine by virtue of a collaborative contract that doesn't look like it 15 years ago, didn't look like a contract at all. Uh, it was radically incomplete. Um, it required um, and depended upon the development of endogenous trust in order to actually uh, develop the substantive terms of the, of the transaction. Those kinds of contracts uh, are, are now ubiquitous in environments of high uncertainty where innovation is necessary. You shift to standardized markets where uh, uncertainty is reduced in large part by virtue of the existence of the market. Uh, the market uh, evens out uncertainty uh, and, and to risk, which is a very valuable uh, service that the market provides. And there, I think innovation is, is uh, discouraged. And as I suggested earlier in my comment, indeed, maybe even inconsistent with the interests of, uh, of the client. And so thinking about uh, these two poles of contract between bespoke and standardized transaction may help you understand why we see innovation in some areas and not in others. Let me just uh, address the regional uh, and I guess I have a question. So, uh, and maybe I missed it. So, regional would that be in the sense of where the private equity firm is located, where the company that's subject to the deal is located? Um, I think we could probably do something with the private equity firm, although I don't know if there's much variation on their location. But perhaps there is. Uh, but we haven't looked at region. But I think it would be interesting to do so. But but when you say region, uh, what should be our definition of region? That's a great question. So there's a lot of uh, literature on this. Saxanian and others have been writing on the fact that you would find different contracting, whether you're in Silicon Valley, in Boston, in Tel Aviv, basically innovation hubs. And that is something that I spend a lot of time with as well. Also New York, right? Because um, the firms are different. Um, and so you would expect to find different types of uh, contractual provisions and protections. For the investors, for the investors. So we focus on the PE firm location. I guess we didn't find much attorney effects, but, but we could look at the attorney firm location as well. Maybe that might be driving something. Yes, it. that's what I would do because the attorneys are the ones that are picking. And so I think it's the attorneys that are driving this. For example, there's also um, a paper by um, um, from Harvard, um, I'm blocking Brofman and um, I'm just blocking on his name now, where they find that it's the attorneys that are driving the choice of the language. So yes, I think where your firm um, is located is going to make a big difference. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, on the second question uh, uh, to uh, Professor Lips and Kostritsky, uh, just maybe add on. Uh, uh, you know, I think you're. I'm persuaded that the sort of undifferentiated ESG term is probably at best meaningless and uh, <laughs> and um, and maybe harmful in uh, uh, in some ways. But is there something more? Focused, uh, more limited, uh, a more limited ESG term uh, that could be in a corporate charter, or you, does it need to be in a, a supplier contract that uh, the company won't use slave labor, rather than in the charter that they won't uh, uh, that they won't uh, contract with suppliers that use child labor or slave labor? Sort of like body shop, right? Used to have, yeah, but like body shop used to have a, a charter provision that said we, you know, we won't. Engage in animal testing, even if it's uh, uh, wealth maximizing. Sorry, because I thought that actually John and Juliet's presentations kind of pulled together that point. I mean, what John was giving us, I think, is a bunch of very precise ways that you can address the ambiguity that Juliet identified through a contract. And I thought that, that was actually a defense you know, beyond what you talked about in your presentation of doing this through contract, the fact that you can be that precise. The other piece of that is I think it also provides flexibility. So, you know, I would be worried about those kind of things in a charter, because even though we might be able to identify some of them, they might be things that evolve over time in terms even of just relative importance. And being able to do this through contract doesn't lock you in the same way. I mean, you think about, you know, frozen charters and so forth. and you know, the, the worry about doing this within the corporate structure. So um, I think to some degree that answers some of your questions, right? Because you're not, it's not unrestricted choice. Yes, it's not unrestricted choice, but he, how do you get around the, um, and this is kind of what's troubling me, is the sacrifice of firm value. Um, in other words, that is really the hidden issue here is, when you pursue ESG, yes, but at what cost? And that's not really disclosed. You could say, oh, I want to pursue you know, fair labor practices, but what the investor really needs to know is at, at what cost? I mean, what, are, we gonna, are we talking about the sacrifice of firm value to have a, a nice supply chain? Well, but two answers to that. One, implicitly, all corporate contracts do involve those choices and trade-offs, right? And number two, there's a certain limit to our capacity to really know, right? So if we pick factory scrubber A versus scrubber B, right, there might be a difference in cost, there might be a difference in terms of the environment. Um, it's not clear that we could come up with a clear sort of map of which is best for the corporation in the long term. And by putting it in the contract, we're actually saying, you know, this is a business decision that, you know, the fact that it affects the environment doesn't change it from any other business decision. But to the extent that the models for looking at the effect on firm value are still, um, you know, sort of preliminary, and there is a debate about whether the pursuit of this or that step will negatively affect firm value. Yes, it can all be hidden um, and all rationalized in terms of long-term value. But people, <laughs> when when there is this idea that you might be, one of the things you might be doing is pursuing stakeholder value at the expense of shareholder value. We should know that. We should somehow know that. But, I mean, the decision to put lights on a baseball stadium, where's Bob? <laughs> right? I mean, is that pursuing shareholder value or is that good for the community? And how do we know at the time we're making the decision? And 25 years later, does that value But maybe what's different is that um, the... Um, there is this incentive to sort of um, market yourself um, this way in order to get, um, you know, investors, um, and then to hide what you, you know, sort of. It's a, a little different from well, you know, the baseball, yeah, um, example. I think because you you have an incentive to um, um, either greenwash or hide. Um, you know, what your real strategy is in a way um, to get investors and then um, without really telling them, you know, what the sacrifices will be, the cost. But investors aren't locked in, are they? 
right? So if you're hiding what you're doing to get investors, okay. investors are the group that's about, like, uh, probably freest to leave. But are they, um, are they going to know? Are they going to know that there's, you know, that that's the strategy going on, that there's uh, value being sacrificed? Yeah, I think the answer is they may not know until it's too late, right? right that's the right. sort of the Rana Plaza yeah. disaster story that right. everybody knows is, right, you know, J.C. Penney learns only after the fact that there's slavery in their supply chain. That they claim they didn't know, who knows what they knew. But um, it's, a, I mean, these, as I said, like, there are four, at least four reasons to be cautious about that, and that is certainly one of them. Um, in, in, I mean, in response to Juliet's observation about generality versus specificity, I would tend to agree that you know, that, that a term of the, the sort that you're describing wouldn't be doing much work. And certainly that's not what you see in the real world. Folks are trying to be very specific for all sorts of reasons, some of which have something to do with what looks like law to us, some of which have something to do with business or other things. I mean, contract does a lot of work, only some of which is legal. And I think that's part of what's so interesting about this. Um, you know, whether these terms are enforceable in any meaningful sense is a really hard question because, and this goes to your second point, like, this stuff is hard to cash out. And at the end of the day, like, you know, one of the papers I wrote about this is about specific performance in the study. Like, what court thinks it's going to order somebody overseas to stop using slaves? Like, the answer is none in the United States. And do you think you're going to go register that judgment in that foreign country and get a court there to do it? No, the whole point is the government there probably supports it, right? So it's a real problem. Um, but all that means is that these are real problems and contract can do a little bit of work here, maybe, but not a ton. In terms of the the cashing out question specifically, I mean, it's a great question. I think that's the, at the heart of all this. Like, can we create, you know, apples and compare apples instead of apples to oranges, social to economic? And, you know, Lopaki's the you know, new paper says, yeah, actually in three years or four years, there's going to be a standard set of metrics by which we will measure social responsibility. And of course, we'll only have four universal shareholders. And so everybody, you know, will be living in a sort of Marxist kind of post-revolutionary world where everybody is, you know, living their fully enlightened self. Um, I'm not sure I'm quite as persuaded, but, you know, I think, I think there is a view that we are kind of lurching gradually towards concretizing some of these other values that we've thought of as not economic, but in fact they do have economic consequences, and the economic rhetoric doesn't necessarily pick up all the nuance, but I think they're sort of working to get there, is my instinct. But it's slow and hard and messy. Why don't we take one more question and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll break for lunch here. We'll be able to resolve all of this probably better over lunch, uh, but uh, here, here we go. Thanks. I had a question for uh, Professors Gulati and Choi and Scott. Um, at the end when you're exploring what are the reasons for differences, I, had, I was kind of thinking of some other ones and wondered if you had explored these. Um, particularly wondered about the difference in differences between the investors in these products and the kind of expected closeness of relationship they're going to have. You know, sovereigns and corporates are going to have you have a pretty commoditized market and a pretty liquid or relatively liquid. And investors, you know, there's sort of the question of not just is is the client. Um, monitoring it carefully, but how about the investor side? Are they monitoring carefully because they're going to be illiquid or in for a longer time versus just kind of buying through the market? Well, that's an excellent question, and I think it is relevant um, uh, certainly to the agency cost story and maybe even the coordination story. So, for example, uh, in sovereign debt, uh, the investors uh, uh, operate at two different levels, and the first level are when the uh, bonds are issued onto the market, uh, the investor is remote, uh, removed in some sense from the transaction. The underwriter is concerned about placing those bonds at the best possible price in a good market window. Uh, the investors who buy the bonds, even if they're fancy um, uh, uh, Harvard uh, University uh, firms and other large scale investors like that, uh, really have a uh, very little role in uh, influencing the outcome of the contract. So that's not true uh, in private equity particularly, where the investors are the powerful entity that probably are in, in, in important. And so 
to some extent, I think you're wise to separate the, the, the investors from the agency cost analysis, although I think it, what that does is it, it bleeds into the, the, the question then of, of, of agency cost because uh, you have more monitoring in, in private equity and very little monitoring um, in, say, sovereign or corporate, or corporate bonds. All right, that brings us uh, brings us to lunch. Please join me uh, again in thanking uh, all of our panelists, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, we will reconvene at uh, one fifteen.